Hello and welcome to Insight. Today we have with us Mr. Kom Carpentier. Kom is an author, thinker and Europe expert. He has also been the convener of World Affairs Journal as well as a contributor to many leading magazines and newspapers across the world. Come join us today as we discuss the future of Europe, its identity and unity. Kom, thank you so much for joining us on Inside. It's really a pleasure to have you here today. Um, let's start this interview by understanding the basics. What really uh, does it mean when we talk about uh, European identity or European unity? Greetings. Uh, European identity historically is primarily geographic and because of the relatively small size of the continent, if you only talk about so-called Western Europe, then you are talking about uh, land size which is uh, just about the size of uh, India minus Pakistan and Bangladesh. So it's not a very big uh, sp space in comparison to Asia or Africa, but it has had a very tormented history. It has been uh, invaded repeatedly from uh, particularly from the east but also from the south and there has been a lot of overlapping uh, in the culture and history of the various parts of Europe. In other words, different countries or states in Europe have ruled other parts of Europe and in turn have been ruled by them. So uh, the European identity uh, was formed primarily out of the Roman Empire, because they were the ones who created an administrative uh, unit, which encompassed even Britain, uh, as well as uh, uh, Western and Southern Germany, and pretty much everything that we call now Southern and Eastern Europe, and of course France. Uh, these countries came uh, into being later, when uh, certain so-called barbarian invasions occurred, when the Roman Empire collapsed. So at that point, Europe lost its uh, political unity, but Christianity gave it a religious unity. Now, I should say that uh, the Romans had already given Europe some sort of religious unity because all subjects of the Roman Empire worship most of the same gods and they had similar rituals. And of course, the emperor was the living god, as it were. Yeah. Now, Christianity replaced the emperor uh, with Christ and eventually with the Pope, uh, especially when Western Europe broke away from Eastern Europe, religiously speaking. So then you had a succession of empires which tried to recreate the Roman condominium. Uh, the first one was probably Charlemagne, you know, Charles the Great, uh, who primarily was a German. And then you had the succession of Roman empires which never achieved complete unity of Europe, but tried. And eventually, of course, you had uh, the French kings and Napoleon in particular, who was almost there. I mean, he almost brought all Europe under his rule, but only for a few years. And finally, of course, the last attempt, very ill-fated attempt, was Adolf Hitler's, uh, who thought that he could recreate uh, what was called the Third Reich, which essentially was the original medieval Reich in which all people in Europe obeyed uh, German rule. So this gives you a sense of where Europe uh, is, took its shape. And shortly after World War II, when Europe was very, very badly uh, hurt and uh, suffering from the consequences of the war, there was a, an attempt made by various politicians to, and also by bureaucrats to uh, create a democratic European Union, uh, originally purely in economic terms, common market, and then more and more politically. But it's interesting that this union as a project was not a um, homogeneous project because it had a number of different components and uh, there was no agreement on all aspects of the project. For example, uh, there were those who wanted primarily a union between France and Germany, like De Gaulle, which is essentially eventually would extend to the rest of the continent and perhaps through some sort of an agreement encompass the Soviet Union or whatever state came after the Soviet Union. Uh, but then there was also the so-called Atlantic side, which was primarily supported by the British and the Americans. Uh, 
and they wanted uh, what they considered to be the West, which we now call the West, which later came to be known as the Golden Billion, which essentially was the countries around the North Atlantic. Uh, and of course, leadership uh, belonged to the United States and accessorily to Britain, so the English-speaking people. Uh, and that has remained the hard core of Europe as we know it today, because essentially Europe has uh, surrendered, you might say, its leadership to the United States for the last 60 years. And despite appearances, that uh, complete, uh, I would say, submission to the US uh, has only strengthened in the last few years, simply because of economic factors and other factors that we can discuss later on. Correct. But, uh, you know, we hear a lot in the news about the kind of immigration that Europe has, you know, the West has, uh, in terms of illegal immigration as well, as well as, you know, the open door policy. Uh, this sort of a union that we see today, is it threatened in any way by the influx of immigration? Or rather, if I was to put it in a different way, do you think that the open door policy is fairly naive to the unity of the union? The open door policy by nature is unviable. If you consider uh, the fact that Africa now has more than a billion people and many of them would like to emigrate to Europe because of difficult uh, living conditions in Africa and the comparative advantages that Europe so far has offered in terms of living standards and income opportunities and social welfare system. So Europe cannot uh, really implement a, an open door policy without eventually collapsing economically and socially. However, this has been a, a dream or a vision projected by a certain uh, rather utopian, perhaps not so utopian, perhaps people who have an agenda, which is not necessarily what we could would consider the common sense interest of Europe. Uh, there are certain ideologies which prevail over realities. I would give the very well-known example of George Soros, who, uh, following uh, the, the open society concept, believes that uh, the more people of different cultures are together, the more pr prosperous and also the more free uh, Europe or any country will be. In the sense that you see, you have certain minorities that have been for a long time uh, in the past, affected by uh, a certain homogeneous and perhaps uh, authoritarian majority. In the case of Europe, it was probably the church or for Protestant countries, the Protestant uh, churches. Therefore, there was that sense that if you bring a lot of people from different backgrounds, religiously and culturally, there will be no common ground and nobody will be able to impose a particular concept of society. Uh, therefore, you can see where the idea of multiculturalism uh, takes its root. But unfortunately, more and more people believe that it is a very dangerous uh, utopia, because if you don't have a common core, then you don't see how, why and how a society should hold together, especially in times of trials. Correct. Correct. But would I be correct in saying that even today, um, Europe, and when we talk about the civilization, the culture that it has, is predominantly rooted in uh, Christianity, right? If that is the case, in your opinion, then how does this influx of immigration that is coming in with its culture uh, assimilate in the kind of civilization that Europe historically has had? You see, there were two views of uh, assimilation vis -a, uh, I would say there is a view of assimilation which is uh, contrasted with the proposal for um, abs you know, absorption or essentially um, simply um, coexistence, as it were, uh, or integration, because integration is not very easily defined, but it's not supposed to be the same as assimilation. The question is that from the beginning, uh, the question of the Christianity as a, as a core of European culture has been in dispute. I'm talking from the beginning of the European Union, 
because uh, on the one hand you had countries that wanted the emphasis on Christianity, particularly Italy for obvious reasons and Germany, and on the other you had countries like France which has a uh, very uh, secular past uh, since the French Revolution, and France was very opposed to the concept of religion uh, being mentioned in the, among the pillars of Europe. Uh, there was a better uh, chance for an agreement uh, with regard to so-called uh, Greco-Roman common identity, in the sense Greek culture and Roman political institutions, including Roman law and Roman philosophy. But uh, that was uh, something which, uh, in a way, provided a framework, but even that was in dispute because once you include Eastern Europe, then uh, the Roman common culture is not shared by them. Uh, they come from a Greek and Oriental uh, civilization. So that also created a problem. However, in the case of, uh, you know, the issue of religion, which to many people meant oppression uh, because of uh, what Europe knew over centuries, was obviously not ever resolved. And even today, uh, countries have different politics vis-a-vis -vis, uh, religion. For example, Greece st still has a state religion even though European uh, Union member states are not supposed to have a state religion. Uh, Germany, for example, finances, the state finances its churches, whereas in France, uh, churches are not uh, supposed to be uh, financed by the state. I mean, they may be financed by the state insofar as, you know, maintaining the buildings and all that, but they cannot actively support a, a church as a state institution. So it, it's supposed to be, in a way, private, which is, again, very hypocritical because you all know that the Catholic Church in France, uh, no matter how relatively few people now observe, follow it, still it's considered, historically, the main faith of the, of the nation. Gom, uh, is opposition to immigration the same as opposing multiculturalism? To an extent. I mean, the, nowadays, if you follow the public discussions in France, which are very intense, but also in other countries, you see that uh, you cannot openly say that you do not want other religions to come in, although more and more people are saying it. On the other hand, it is legitimate to say, I don't want another culture to mix with mine because I'm proud of my culture, and this is what makes us what we are. Therefore, uh, we don't want to just become a sort of a mixed bag of uh, Asia, Africa, America, uh, whatever other uh, continent is there. So from that viewpoint, uh, eventually you can say the debate is cultural, but uh, you cannot separate the culture from the religion. And more and more, there is a very open rejection of Islam in countries that are members of the EU, as well as in countries which are not, like Switzerland. And on the other hand, you have the left, which for very electoral reasons uh, often and generally claims to support minority religions, including Islam. Why? Because they feel they can corner that uh, vote bank. And uh, it also loosens the power, it uh, weakens the power of the conservatives. So the left has been an objective ally of uh, Islam, but of other minority religions. Uh, and again, in spite of the fact that the left claims to be uh, agnostic, generally, uh, or, uh, you know, at least secular, therefore they should not have a business of supporting uh, minority religions. Uh, they actually do, because uh, it's, let's face it, it's opportunistic. But the question is now that nobody can deny that uh, the eruption of Islam in large numbers within the European fabric has created major problems because uh, there are just too many divergences with regard to uh, domestic and international issues. And uh, it can no longer, they can no longer be managed simply because the threshold has been reached where Islamic populations in many European countries have become too big. And when they start participating in politics and putting public pressure, then you essentially have to take them into account or else you risk uh, unre massive unrest. We've also heard a lot of stories in India about areas like Malmo, Rosengar, you know. Uh, we've seen um, the kind of changes happening even in uh, the UK. Uh, I think London is now only 50% uh, made up of uh, uh, indigenous population. Um, 
how is this happening? Because a lot of these areas seem to have their own rules and regulations. They have their own laws that are brought in, you know, with the culture that all these uh, immigrants bring in. How does the general population deal with that? And how is it allowed to happen looking at the kind of future that we seem to be facing, which seems to be in Europe uh, somewhat at conflict? I don't think anybody has an answer, at least a, an implementable answer, simply because uh, it is now too difficult uh, in a democratic framework to change the demographic makeup. And you cannot ignore the opinions and the pressure uh, that come from the minority communities. Uh, I'll give you a simple example which has just come up uh, when uh, Sweden and Finland applied to join the European Union. Turkey opposed it. Why? Because both Finland and Sweden have provided refuge to Kurdish militants whom uh, Turkey regards as terrorists. So Turkey said, uh, unless uh, you extradite these people and uh, give them to the Turkish state, we cannot allow you to join the EU. Uh, sorry, the NATO. Uh, I, I hope I didn't say the EU. I was talking about NATO. So obviously, that shows you how much now, within the European context, the Turkey is not in Europe. It is in Europe from the point of view of NATO, but it is not in Europe from the point of view of the EU, even though it's been applying for the last 50, 40 years. But uh, the fact is that already there are inconciliable differences, uh, also with regard to problems affecting Muslim countries, uh, the Palestinian issue. Uh, clearly, uh, the views of the Muslim populations are very much at variance with the views of the average uh, indigenous population. So essentially, the people who are the most affected are, I would say, the lower and the middle classes because they have to deal day to day with a change in their environment and the problems that this can cause. Whereas the upper class, the really wealthy, can essentially uh, escape most of those problems for very simple reasons. They have the money to live where they want and they can protect themselves. So you find a lot of so-called liberal globalism among the elites, especially the financial class, and you find a great deal of resistance and increasingly rebellion among the masses, what you used to call the masses, which is essentially the former working class, because most of them are no longer working classes, and uh, the middle class, basically, the small entrepreneurs, the people who have to deal with day-to-day -day problems when, for example, their uh, area has become uh, heavily Islamized, and therefore that changes the very relationship of the local powers to the population. So how does one deal with this sort of uh, immigration? I mean, not just in volume of the amount of people that are coming in, but also in terms of uh, the dangers that it poses once that they have settled in, because clearly there seems to be an issue of uh, getting along with local populations. You know, uh, they bring in a certain amount of their culture, which fair enough is uh, fairly acceptable, but uh, you know, also their uh, local laws. No. So how does one deal with this sort of uh, immigration uh, or in a more sort of state level? Well, you know, the state has a lot of theories. I mean, the states uh, and the European Union as a whole has a lot of theories about what to do, you know, like giving more money to the uh, poorer immigrant uh, majority areas, trying to give them better facilities as far as education, jobs. And clearly, those people haven't always had it easy, although arguably they had it easier in Europe than they might have had it in their native lands. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, Europe has participated along the United States in wars that have also created massive immigration from certain countries in the Middle East and Africa. So naturally, now they have in a way to face the problems that they have created. But this being said, it's uh, been shown again and again that uh, pouring money into immigrant communities does not necessarily solve the problem. You will have individual cases of people who get out of poverty, who get educated, who become entrepreneurs or who uh, enter a profession and who do well. 
and there are lots of these people, but it's probably not the majority. The majority remains broadly unassimilated and probably unable to assimilate because they do not have the educational facilities or perhaps even the willingness and the family support to get into that. So you come to a situation where in France and in many countries like Belgium, the majority of drug dealing, for example, is carried out by uh, immigrant communities belonging to a particular community. Correct. I mean, to a particular religion. Uh, but also uh, the fallback of that is that all immigrant communities, irrespective of uh, you know, the kind of uh, ideal citizens that they are, because there are some immigrant communities, for instance, the Indian community, that seems to be topping the list in terms of education or uh, uh, professional services. Uh, they all face the fallback of, you know, how one community reacts to uh, immigration, you know. So would you say that's true or not, that there is a difference between all these communities on how they react in Western countries, but the fallback of one community is on all of them? Yes, but remember that uh, communities, I mean, rather immigrants, uh, come from very different social backgrounds. Uh, so, for example, a lot of the Indians who have moved into Europe are generally from the middle class and are well-to-do and educated and they often got their education there. So they have no problem becoming uh, well-paid professionals. The same can be said about most people, many people from the Near East, the Middle East, Lebanese, Syrians, uh, Iraqis, Iranians. They generally belong to, uh, you might say, the top uh, layer of their own societies. And, or at least if they come to, from the middle class, they can easily uh, assimilate because they have enough uh, educational and cultural uh, preparation to, in, to, to get in, into a society and, and play their part. Whereas uh, if you are talking about very poor people who came from illiterate families, either their parents came as uh, laborers or uh, their parents uh, might have had uh, no opportunity to educate the children and uh, because of the traditional family structure often broke down in the French or in the European context, then the children essentially were out of control and uh, they turned to petty crime and often to major crime and sometimes also to terrorism because there is a bridge between uh, petty crime and terrorism for supposedly Islamic causes. So clearly the families are not able to control them and that's a big problem that now uh, every day in uh, most Western European countries the police has to fight young people, very young people, sometimes less than 15, who are essentially uh, ordinary uh, uh, delinquents. I mean, they are just basically carrying out illegal activities and they fight the police for the sake of it almost. Correct. So what would you call Europe now? Is it, um, you know, it's been the mothership of many, many ideologies, democracy, fascism. What is it today? Is it liberal? Is it secular? Is it conservative? How would you define it? I would have said until about four or five years ago, it was primarily liberal with a growing conservative uh, reaction. Uh, liberal in the sense, not the way Americans understand it, you know, but uh, liberal in the economic sense. Uh, although, yeah, there, is a com com there are some common uh, points between the American concept of liberalism and the European concept of liberalism. But in Europe, liberalism is regarded as more to the right than the traditional left-wing ideology, whereas for Americans, liberalism is practically left-wing, far left. Uh, in Europe, what we have is traditional left-wing parties, which were Stalinists until not so long ago, especially in France, and which have now become a mixture of socialism and some uh, watered-down communism, uh, various degrees. They are all more or less together now because they are not strong enough to be separate, so the whole left has to coalesce if it wants to survive, and that includes the Greens, by the way, in most European countries. So that left remains uh, definitely not liberal in the sense that they do not like the rule of capital, they don't like private enterprise, they like state control and state ownership. On the other hand, you have the ruling class of the EU, which is primarily liberal, and now you have this huge European bureaucracy out of Brussels, uh, which operates on the basis of uh, 
planned economy, you know, which, I mean, it's been often uh, derided as some sort of new Soviet Union. And they used to be very, you know, nobody knew about them. But now you have some high uh, profile figures like Ursula von der Leyen, who give orders about everything and anything and decide from one day to the next, this is what you can watch, this is what you cannot watch, we are going to ban that medium because it's Russian, or you know, you have to get vaccinated with that particular company because I made a deal with them. Yeah. So you are getting a sense of authoritarianism which is no longer supported by any kind of democratic consensus. And we see the European Union now getting more and more into fights with countries which want to uphold certain national prerogatives, like Hungary, like Poland, but they are even having brushes now with the Netherlands, let's not talk about Britain, which got out. And you have uh, increasingly nationalist, center-right, and sometimes far-right parties, which are coming up and which are very un anti-European, or at least Eurosceptical. Uh, but uh, does that mean that religiously also, uh, it is more secular, or would it would you say that it's becoming more conservative? No, I think the trend is now more towards conservatism. Now, conservatism doesn't mean religious because a lot of people do not practice religion, but they feel the need for a structure which is based on a cultural identity and which therefore invokes religion. So they might not go to church every Sunday, but they will marry in church. Uh, and at least once a year, maybe for Christmas, they'll go because it's part of the festivities. So you see, there is that uh, combination of uh, secularism and uh, attachment to cultural values. Uh, there are many countries where hardly anybody goes to church now, like uh, Sweden. And I think there is perhaps a connection between the problems caused by mass immigration and the complete loss of religious identity among the local people. Because if you look at Italy, it doesn't have the same kind of problems. Why? Because all in all, Italians have remained Catholics. And therefore, even the minority communities like uh, the Muslims, well, they do not generally have this kind of problem. But I think what happens is when you have a massively secularized society, and then you have a strongly religious community in it, then you, you can see a lot of alienation. And it often breeds uh, contempt and uh, mutual hostility. But does that also sort of push the local community, the indigenous population, into becoming more religious? Not necessarily, because once you lost religious identity, for many people it doesn't make a lot of sense anymore. You know, for example, especially in the poorer classes, uh, take a country like Belgium, but maybe other countries too, where a lot of people, especially women, will convert to Islam quite easily. Why? Because on the one hand, they have schoolmates, school friends, who tell them, you know, why don't you come into a religion? And the fact that they don't have a strong family unity and a sense of religious and cultural and spiritual belonging makes Islam very attractive to them. So people might go into an order religion. They might also go into Buddhism. You know, lots of people go into Tibetan Buddhism. That's generally for the upper classes. Or they might even go for certain kinds of uh, Hindu uh, cults. Uh, they might practice yoga and go into a lot of other things that go with it. So you can see there is a religious quest, which comes from the loss of uh, the fundamental Christian identity, and also perhaps because many people feel that Christianity in its current form is no longer answering their needs. Correct. Maybe uh, it's sort of pushing them more towards seeking spirituality than uh, a more set uh, ideas of rules and regulations within our practiced religion. I think both spirituality and spir a sense of community. People need a community. Okay. Practicing a religion alone is very difficult for most people. Uh, you're, they are not even interested in it. They want to have a sense of belonging with other people whom they can really cooperate with. Correct. Correct. Um, go moving on, um, what do you think, we've, we've all watched the Ukraine-Russia war very closely, what do you think the impact of that is uh, on Europe and do you think that is going to have some sort of impact uh, on Europe uh, in terms of a new world order emerging? Certainly it will. Uh, I think Ukraine has proven to be a real disaster for uh, the European Union. I'm not talking about the rest of the world. 
obviously the, the first afflicted are the Ukrainians. But Europe has, I think, completely misread the Ukrainian crisis and it has been exploited in the wrong way by certain vested interest groups, particularly in the United States, but also in Britain and in continental Europe as well. They decided to throw in their lot with a sort of a fictitious Ukrainian democratic uh, European nation that was bravely fighting the Russian uh, fascists or the Soviets, however they called them. And therefore, they decided that it was critical to the unity and integrity of Europe to support Ukraine to the hilt, even though many of the member states did not agree. So there was a lot of hypocrisy about it because they pretended that they had a common front and that they were willing to, to do any sacrifice to help the Ukrainians, even going without uh, oil and gas from Russia and uh, essentially uh, cutting their noses to spite their faces, which is exactly what it's amounting to. But uh, on the other hand, uh, clearly the basis for it was not there. Ukraine has never been really an independent country. It was completely integrated within the larger Russian cultural, economic and political structure. Even the US State Department had concluded to that in the 1940s, late 40s, early 50s. They said, you know, there is no way Ukraine will be a viable independent state. So the fact that they threw all those lessons of history in the waste paper basket and decided that Ukraine was a uh, sort of, uh, you know, critical cause, I mean, uh, something that required uh, mobilization, uh, turned completely against Europe. One, because a lot of smaller countries felt they were being bullied and they were being forced to forsake their own interests for the sake of some uh, common principle which they did not even uh, believe in. And particularly the very heavy-handed, uh, you know, NATO uh, influence, uh, backed mostly by the EU, EU Commission through people like Ursula von der Leyen, who have very close personal association with the United States. So that created a sense that there was almost a betrayal of European interest. And very eminent people spoke about that, including uh, the grandson of General de Gaulle, who uh, gave a speech at the Russian embassy in, in Paris in which he said, I believe we have betrayed all the ideals of my grandfather and we don't understand why the French government and others are blindly following the Americans in what is turning to be economically a disaster. Uh, clearly there was the hand of the US uh, and you already have a very clueless administration in Washington so clearly they are not even sure how to deal with it. Uh, and once again we see public policies being held hostage to private interest. The Americans had made a lot of uh, moves in Ukraine. They had practically taken over the country. They were paying themselves huge remunerations, you know, beginning with the son of the current president. And they thought therefore that Ukraine was like a sort of a cash pump, you know, that they would be able to exploit. At the same time, they could make it a sort of a tool against Russia and uh, use it as a way to try to destabilize the Russian government. And Russia had been warning about this and warning and warning and they didn't want to, the Europeans didn't want to listen because they were listening to the Americans who kept telling them, oh, don't even pay attention to the Russians. We, we, they do, cannot do anything to us. And eventually, I think the Americans and the British, just out of the EU, are quite happy that the EU is uh, faltering because for them, it's a way of showing the European states that they cannot really make a common front unless they just follow the Americans. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it has completely discredited a number of European governments, especially the German government, which was already very frail and which uh, is uh, now facing an economic downturn like Germany has not known since uh, 40 years. You know? So obviously you can expect the German population to become very hostile to this ruling coalition in Germany. Mm -hmm. But considering that, uh, you know, a country from across the Atlantic had so much of influence on the, you know, frontiers of Europe, so as to say, uh, how did Europe allow this to happen? How did it not see it coming? Because there was no real leadership in the sense that nobody was able to speak on behalf of Europe. Uh, some people claimed they were like Macron, but he wasn't. And even the Russians told him so in plain terms. 
you know, it's, it's very interesting if you follow the debate between him and Putin, and apparently they spoke for about 100 hours in all since the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis. And every time Putin told him, listen, what you are telling me is just your opinion, but it doesn't reflect either NATO or the EU's views, because you don't represent either of them, and you don't have the power to change them. So uh, that's why now the French media are, uh, you know, there have been these titles about Macron's diplomatic fiasco, simply because he was trying to uh, speak on behalf of uh, entities over which he had no real control. So the Russians said, we'll go ahead and do what we think is in our interest, and you can do what you please, because we are not really uh, concerned about what you can do to us. So clearly, the fact that there was no real strategic coordinated uh, leadership of Europe. You know, we are back to what uh, Kissinger said many years ago. If I want to talk to Europe, who do I call? I mean, you know, there are just too many powers and they can take arbitrary decisions, but they cannot really agree on a common strategic policy with a long-term perspective. So is there any sort of, and coming to my final question, is there any sort of a common view that then Europe or the EU has of India, uh, especially now in the light of the Ukraine-Russia war? Uh, you see, if you're talking about European states, each of them keeps his own counsel with regard to India. And I don't think they really expect the EU to regulate policies versus India, except in the case of, for example, of a uh, free trade agreement. But otherwise, uh, clearly, the states that have strong relations with EU, uh, with India, primarily France, of course, Britain, Germany, and to an extent Italy, they uh, will do with India what they think is uh, best for their own uh, economic and political interest. As far as the EU is concerned, considering that it is now predominantly aligned with uh, American policy, they are not happy with India's uh, unwillingness to go along with what they considered, you know, the League of Democracies and uh, the, the countries that respect uh, the, sovereignty of border, the sovereignty of states and the sanctity of borders. But then again, we know that this has not been applied. You know what recently the president of Serbia said to the German chancellor. He said, you are in love with the territorial integrity of Ukraine and I'm in love with the territorial integrity of Serbia, which you have not respected. So, at that level, I would say that India is seen as a country which is taking more and more its own uh, path and which does not really consider the Western opinion as a uh, regulatory um, sort of uh, norm, essentially. Right. So in that sense, uh, the difference with China, for example, is that China is so powerful that Europe can simply not uh, face China uh, with a hostile uh, attitude simply because China can exercise too many levels to damage the Europeans, even though there is a great deal of distrust and overwhelmingly the European opinion is outraged by uh, what is reported about China's ac actions in uh, Xinjiang, but also vis-a-vis uh, -vis Hong Kong, uh, the threats to Taiwan, a number of other issues. Uh, on the other hand, with India, of course, you always hear in the media about, uh, you know, uh, fascism, Hindu fascism, oppression of minorities, that keeps coming up. But I don't think governments are very much influenced by that. That's more like the politically correct uh, doxa. You know, again, if you look at the European media, most of them are getting financing from one of the big uh, groups like uh, George Soros' foundation or uh, in many cases, uh, Bill Gates. Uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So those media carry out a certain politically correct work message, which does not always reflect the opinion of governments as such. But does that uh, impact local populations on how they perceive India? It does. Uh, it does because most people are not well informed and uh, all they in hear often, except for those who have taken some interest in the question or who have come to India, is that India is oppressing minorities and it's ruled by an increasingly uh, authoritarian Hindu uh, government. You know, now in some cases, I mean, this came from America, but I think many Europeans who subscribe to it, uh, they say India is an authoritarian democracy or an electoral dictatorship. I mean, these kind of terms are used to show the difference between real democracies, which are the supposedly Western ones, 
and the countries which have elections but which do not respect uh, always the, you know, because now democracy is seen to be more about consensus with minorities and not so much about majority rule because majority rule is considered to be dangerous, it's populistic. So if you're not populistic, then you have to have some sort of consensus. But then does that not mean that it undermines majority rights as well? Of course, it does. And that's why you see more and more democracy being replaced by a combination of bureaucracy and judicial authority. In the sense, judges decide what is right and what is wrong. And if the judges decide that this is not right, then even if the majority want it, it won't be done. Now, I can understand that if the majority wants something very bad, uh, morally uh, objectionable, then obviously somebody should step in. But when it comes to the point of saying, you know, such a party does not have an acceptable ideology, so it cannot really win elections. So even if it wins the elections, then you somehow have to cancel the elections or you have to cheat or you have to do something, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but uh, why undermine India's democratic process? The fact that, you know, it has such a large population which increases with every election that comes out and votes. Uh, is it some sort of a colonial hangover where they feel that possibly Indians cannot run a democracy? Or is there any other underlying reason behind it? Uh, or is there also maybe a little splattering of Hindu phobia? I don't think there is Hindu-phobia in most people, except perhaps in uh, people who belong in some way to a church, you know, and who feel that Hindu should be converted. And of course, if you are a polytheist, how can you, you know, be a fully civilized person? Uh, you have to. But this is a minority. I think most people are secular enough that they don't really care about uh, religious identity. What they are more concerned about now is the sense of social justice, you know. Uh, society is pervaded by social justice warriors ideology that you have to fight for the good. And as a result, uh, one, you are right, there is an old colonial prejudice, especially in Britain. You know, we told you these people, you know, once we leave, they can't look at the Chinese, what they are doing to Hong Kong, you know, they, they go back to their old ways. So that's one thing. The other thing, is a fear that India, like China, might become too powerful. And then it would mean further um, decline for the West. Uh, it would lose its importance and it would no longer be able to have a, a predominant uh, influence. So that's clearly a, a vested interest on their part. And then finally, I think it has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, the moment you bring up any kind of religion or religious culture in politics today in the West, you are regarded as highly suspicious. I mean, in America, you can still get away with it uh, because it's an uh, old Judeo-Christian thing, you know, and uh, the core of Jews and uh, Protestant Christians especially will side with you and also conservative Catholics. But if you bring up any other uh, religion as a sort of a state thing, then they don't like it. Making an exception, interestingly, for Muslim countries, because Muslim countries are regarded as a category of their own. You know, the Islam is Islam, and therefore, if they are Muslim, uh, that's it. You know, it's a different civilization, so you have to take them more or less as they are. And, you know, it's visible, for example, in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, where you have Indian art on one side, and you have Muslim art on the other, which includes a lot of Indian art, like Mughal art. So is, Indian, is Mughal art Muslim or Indian? You know, and of course they say, but because it was painted at the court of the Mughals, then it's Muslim. You know. uh, but having said that, uh, uh, I think we're running really short of time. So I have one last question to ask you. Uh, is, does Europe not see the difference between China and India? I mean, like you mentioned that, you know, India might become too powerful and that's maybe one of the points that they take into consideration. But having said that, India will and has always been intrinsically democratic, which is something that China hasn't been. So, you know, if there was a question of comparing these two countries, I think more uh, rationally, you would find India far more receptive to what Europe stands for. Yeah. Yes, but you see, the Chinese have an advantage, paradoxically, in the Western mind, that they were communists. And Europe was long, in love with communism, at least a big part of the European population. So communism is seen as a sort of step forward towards social justice, irrespective of all the atrocities that were committed. Therefore, the Chinese, because they brought prosperity, or at least uh, decent 
stand, living standards to most of their population, they are seen as essentially a great success. And that entitles them to some forgiveness with regard to human rights. Because, yes, but remember, I mean, the whole left wing will still tell you that. Remember how much they have achieved for their, the masses. You know, they have made them into practically middle class people, or at least they have enough to eat and they live in decent conditions. So that is a formidable achievement. Uh, in India, you primarily hear about the enduring misery, the poverty, the social problems, and of course, uh, uh, caste, curries, cows, you know, that's always the thing, uh, thing that the refrain that has been perpetuated. So that in itself creates for India a very unfavorable uh, discourse because uh, you somehow very easily can say, but you know, it's because of Hinduism and superstition that they have the main mired in caste, and then look at how they are fighting and how they are oppressing the Muslims. So, you know, this whole narrative is unfortunately supported and promoted by a lot of uh, intellectuals, particularly Indian intellectuals in the West. And they are the ones who are regarded as authorities, you know. And here people read Arundhati Roy and they uh, read her speeches and they say, what a wonderful person. And look at how she's fighting the injustice of the Indian system. So that comes out a lot, you know. And uh, even Gandhi is used without often being uh, particularly well quoted. Oh yes, but Gandhi was trying to overcome the Hindu uh, oppressive uh, society and he couldn't. All that, uh, that uh, discourse is very prevalent. Gom, thank you very much. That was really an insightful discussion on Europe and its future. I hope to see you again on Insight very soon. Thank you. A pleasure. Thank you. As Europe grapples with many new and challenging geopolitical factors as well as internal pressures, it remains to be seen if the idea of unity in Europe persists or a new order emerges. Thank you for joining Insight. Until next time.